Sue, good morning. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Rover? I'm doing good. So uh, you live, how do you pronounce this? Is it Kavik River Camp? Is that how you pronounce it? Yeah. And uh, yeah, what is that exactly? This is this is a like an outpost and hunters and fishermen use this? Or what is it exactly? Um, I sort of, uh, I tell people to think about it like a really remote and twisted bed and breakfast. It uh, used to be an old uh, oil and explor- exploration camp. And now it's, uh, I, I run it as sort of a bed and breakfast. Uh, for whatever reason, people want to be up in the high Arctic, uh, whether it be ecotourism, ologists. And during the month of August and part of September, uh, hunters come through. But it's it's whatever reason you want to be here, I'll give you a room, some uh, scary stories, and cook you some food. And you started working at this place how? Because you're the only person up there that works there. I'm I'm assuming you can even go long, long periods of time without seeing another person, I assume. Uh, how did you get hooked yeah, up with this? Know, I live, well, I live here year-round, and usually the last person I see is somewhere in September, and then the next person I see is in June. So, um, But uh, the former owners uh, were friends of mine, and uh, they needed somebody to manage and watch the place. And they knew at that point I had a, I lived on the dog team. Uh, I had a 400-mile trap line along the Jim River. And uh, he asked me if I would be willing to do it. And uh, as long as I could bring my dogs at that point, I said, sure, but i got to live there year-round. Now, does... I'm not doing this pansy. Right. Months on, six months off thing. Does, do they pay a decent amount of money for you to live up there in the middle of nowhere? Um... Well, I, that, you know, back then I was working for them, but I since have purchased the place myself. And, uh, and no, I mean, life is what you make of it no matter where you go and uh, how much money it makes relative right, to, to what you need to survive. Um, but no, I basically, you know, I'm not going to die a millionaire, that's for damn sure. But, uh, you know, what I'm doing is paying for a style of life. As a Caucasian, I'm not allowed to have a permanent dwelling nor own land on the North Slope, but I can lease land and run a business. And so that's how I get around and I'm able to live up here. Now, people are surprised at this, but you say you don't get lonely up there all by yourself. Not at all. No. no you know, there's a you can't do this kind of a lifestyle this remote and uh, live in, and uh, come from a place of, you know, emotions. So, and I don't feel lonely. I register that I live alone, but it doesn't follow that I get lonely. Um, I find myself pretty hilarious. You know, I like myself, I like my personality, and I'm fun to hang around with. So, I don't get too lonely. Now, this begs the question, of course, I don't know how old you are, uh, Sue, but do you ever long for uh, companionship, sexual companionship from, from people? Or do you have someone that comes over every now and then? Or do you just go, forget it, who needs sex in life? Uh, well, you know, I mean, since you brought it up, I've got a pair of hands. So if I need that kind of company, <laughs> I, I got it made. But uh, as far as uh, companionship, I'm, I'm going to be 51 this year, and I, ha- I do have a retired sled dog named Ermin. <laughs> that was a 50th uh, birthday present. And uh, she's half blind and can hear even less, so we make a good team. You know, I say she's, uh, I'm bent and she's broken, so we make a good good pair. But now, no, that's just something, uh, 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 a companion in that way. Man, there's a lot more important things in life than that. Um, you've gone through, my understanding, uh, quite a bit of hardship up there in the middle of the Arctic Circle. You... You've been attacked by bears how many, just once or, or multiple times? Um, yeah, as far as an attack that, uh, you know, there, there was an attack several years ago that uh, caused me, I laid here 10 days till somebody found me and I had to have spinal and hip surgery. Um, that's the most violent of the attacks, but I've probably really close run-ins where they come through the side of the tent wall at me or chasing me up and down buildings. Um, Probably five times, maybe more. There's 83 grizzlies that live within 10 miles of camp that they monitor, and probably twice that amount that they don't. Do you so, have to carry a gun with you all the time because these grizzlies will just attack you if they catch you out someplace? Um, well, it's a wise person. I mean, there's, there's, I'm only 15 miles from the, from the Arctic Ocean, so 
the the risk of polar bears is there, uh, the wolf packs. I mean, there's a lot of apex predators, and I'm nowhere near the top of that food chain. So, yeah, a wise person, um, I tell people if you want to act like a pork chop, you'll be a pork chop. So carry some kind of firearm in case you need it. Most times you're able to turn these animals away and, and make them decide to chew on squirrels or something else instead. But when you get a determined uh, predator, it, it's a good idea to have some protection. What do you do if you come around a corner and there's a grizzly bear there uh, and, and you don't shoot it? But what do you do to prevent being attacked? Do you, like, try to, like, yell at the bear and scare him away? Are you quiet? Do you not look at it? Do you, I mean, what's the... Or do you play it by ear and figure out, just wing it? I mean, how, what's, what's the method you use to survive something like that? Well, yeah, you know, I mean, you do have to wing it. Um, they're just going about being bears. You know, they're, they don't wake up in the morning and say, oh, that damn Sue, let's go find her. Uh, well, maybe one or two will, but most of them are just running around being bears. And so if you come around a corner and you see one, well, Hopefully you're paying enough attention that, that that doesn't happen. You see them before they get here. Mm -hmm. But you, you have to judge each situation for itself. Um, there was one time where uh, I we have an unusual thing where the male bears, the boars, are hunting in teams now. And uh, I could hear, but before I realized that's what they were doing, I could hear one in my what I call the boneyard um, out by where I burn all the garbage. I could hear some a bear out that way, so... And my generator had gone down, so I ran out of my building to go to, you know, work on the gen and get it running again so I could have spotlights, and I ran right into the chest of another bear. Mm. And you just play it by ear. Sometimes, I mean, you think that uh, Star Trek has warp speed, run into a bear in the middle of the night in your underwear. <laughs> <laughs> Did, there, back uh, Sue Akins is on with us. Life Below Zero, new episodes premiere uh, tonight at 9 p.m. on the National Geographic channel. So tell me about this attack that you had where you were attacked by a bear and you had you had to lay there, you said, for 10 days? What happened? Well, it, you know, this. I don't enjoy relaying the story um, a, a whole bunch, so I'll, I'll just kind of give you the, the basics of it. There had been a, a bear that, uh, it's a male juvenile bear, he was five to seven years old, and at that age, they're not old enough, they haven't really climbed the rung to be a, a top alpha, mm -hmm. which means they don't have territories of their own, none of the chicks dig them yet. So uh, one of the first steps in a bear climbing the social ladder is uh, getting some territory. Mm -hmm. And I defend camp, and I mark it just like a bear would, and I patrol my territory. And that's, that's part of keeping the clientele safe. And uh, then this was after the clients were done coming in. It was getting really close to winter. And this bear kept on burying a kill on my helicopter pad every night. So every morning I'd get up and I'd dig it up and I'd either send it down the river or burn it. And he'd be screaming and yelling at me from uh, his high vantage point. In the wait a second. He would, uh, wait, so he, you, wait, wait, you said he was burying what on your helipad? A kill, whether it be a, oh, a kill or a wolf or whatever. Yeah, that's okay. one of the ways they mark their territory. Okay, all right. And uh, so he's trying to claim my territory, and uh, I was basically in bear language telling him, nope, I'm okay, it's mine. So I knew there'd be a showdown at some point, and uh, I went to go to the river. It was it was pretty cold. I was wearing a couple of sets of Carhartts and winter gear, um, so I was well padded. But I, in order to get water, I have to put a pump in the middle of the river, and... Uh, to pump it up towards camp. And so I wanted to get one more fill up before the r river froze over. And I looked for the bear. I looked for the bear, didn't see him. And I had to lay my rifle down to get the pump in the river. And he was actually hiding in a cut bank on the river and snatched me up and uh, drug me into the tundra. And he was doing what I call an alpha push. They'll extend their claws and roll you around, put their jaws on your throat uh, and on your head. You can still feel where his teeth went into my head. Oh, wow. Um, but he, uh, in the process of doing that, he tore the hips out of the sockets and, and twisted my spine like a pretzel. But he bluff charged me a bunch more times and then disappeared over the bank. In bear language, he gave me my eviction notice. <laughs> and if, if I left, then he finally subjugated something, and he's one step higher up on the, on the alpha ladder. But uh, I did not remember that I had a rifle down by the river. And I couldn't see very well because uh, the head was cut open and, and I was bleeding fairly profusely. So I made my way back to the dining hall 
and I knew my hips were in trouble. I cleaned up. Bears can be carry a lot of bacteria. So I, I cleaned the head and sewed it up in the arm and tried to call for help and got answering machines. So I left a message, you know, messages, and I grabbed the rifle. I took my uh, gun belt and cinched it over the hips real tight so I could hold the hips in as long as I could. And I went back out. I knew from, from him screaming and yelling at me when I burned his kills that uh, where he'd be hanging out. So I went in the river, found him, shot him, GPSed it for some reason. And uh, But the hips gave out on the way back, so I had to drag myself back into the dining hall, and I couldn't move anymore. And it took 10 days for a pilot to find me and uh, fly me down to Fairbanks, where they uh, kicked me down to the lower world so I could have spinal and hip surgery. That's amazing. I, I mean, did you think when this attack took place, were you thinking to yourself, I'm going to die? Um, You, you don't really have time to think about that. Uh, you, you need to, in any bear attack, as a human being, you've done something in bear language to incur their wrath. And so you need to, and each attack is different, so you, you have just scant seconds to figure out how to, how to get through it. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you're not going to. Um, and so, and, and I knew just from how the interaction I had been having with him that this is a juvenile bear that really, he doesn't want to eat me, he just wants my territory. Mm-hmm. But any when they extend their claws and they're rolling you, um, it's just sort of like a dog when a dog has another dog by the throat and they're laying on their back. They're not writhing. They're, they're saying, okay, so, yeah, you're the stud. You're the man, you know, and, and, and that's what I had to do with the bear. But I knew that since I wasn't planning on vacating the premises, when he came back the next time, then he'd just take me out. So it was a him or I situation. Sue Akins is on with us. Her show Life Below Zero has new episodes tonight, 9 p.m. on the National Geographic Channel. Before I let you go, Sue, uh, how did this television show get put together? Did they approach you? Did you have this idea and approach them? Did uh, someone that came through this camp have the idea? Or how did this get started? Um... If you go back in the Wayback Machine, uh, a gentleman by the name of uh, Tommy Baynard had uh, created a show, a different show, and I appeared on that show. It was a show uh, called Flying Wild Alaska, and the pilots come through here. And Tommy and I became friends, and, and he was intrigued with my lifestyle and the fact that uh, I live here year-round. So when he came up with the idea for the show, um, they came out and asked if I would be willing or uh, consider being a part of it. And for me, one of the important factors was as long as it's not scripted, and by scripted I mean where they, you know, somebody says, hey, I think uh, we need to do an episode where somebody falls in the river. <laughs> right, right, right. There's enough, unusual, yeah, yeah, there's enough unusual harrowing stuff that happens that you don't need to fabricate. So, And that's what this show does. It shows not just myself but uh, uh, several of us that in different areas of the state, live remotely, and uh, all the crazy, wacky stuff that happens, that really happens, and, and how we deal with it. Some episodes are exciting. Some episodes are as simple as, how do you fix things? Do you, you ever know, get... My, my closest store is 500 miles away, so, so going to the store for supplies is pretty hard. Do you ever get worried that uh, it is something that most of us here would take for granted? I know that... I'm a 38-year-old guy. I know that if I start having chest pains, for instance, I could pick up the phone and I can dial 911. Someone is is going to come get me. Are you ever concerned that you may just have a, a, a natural medical thing? Forget even getting attacked by a bear, but um, are you ever worried about this, that it's so remote that if, in order for someone to come save you, especially during the winter, is is unlikely? And have you ever had any scares like that? Um, you know, to, to do this lifestyle, to me, uh, as remote as I do, um, y- you need to be real comfortable with your own death and accept that you're probably going to have some strange, funky, unusual death. But and, and you have to be okay with that. I mean, we all get an expiration date. We just can't see what it is. Uh, I have been uh, sick to the point where I have needed to call in um, and have a doctor either get medicine the, you know, 500 miles away is the doctor, 1,000 miles away is the pharmacy, and then I have to get it here. And uh, medicine can sometimes just, they just fling it out the window with a streamer attached to it. Oh, but as wow. far as chest pain, I mean, I make my own medicines here. Um, the willow plant, back in the day, that's what we used for aspirin. 
Then uh, when we became, uh, you know, chemical engineers, we, we created acetosalicylic acid, which is aspirin. Um, the willow plant is phallic acid. So we made a, a, a genetic counterpart to what nature already gave us. So if I feel I have a few chest pain, I'll just go out, tweak off some branches on the willow, make a tea, and it, it helps it go away. But, yeah, I mean, that's just part of life. We're all going to, we're all, we're, none of us get out alive. You plan on just staying there forever? This is this is your home? You'll die up there? You, you never want to, uh, for instance, maybe uh, retire in Miami or something like that? I leave, you know, I, I tell people that uh, for my personality, I, I'm, I'm like a, an eternal five-year-old. Uh, I refuse to graduate kindergarten. I get snacks and naps and what's not to love. But I have a raven personality. If there's something, and there will be, shiny on the horizon, my, my personality just won't be able to resist checking it out. Someone just so sent me... where I'm at now, yeah. and I've been here 12 years, but who knows what, I, you know, I, I may be uh, on a remote island somewhere five years from now. Someone just I sent me a, a tweet, and they said, this uh, woman is more of a man than you are, Rover. You were complaining earlier today that you have one of those little tiny canker sores on your tongue. You were crying about it. I fully admit this. I would last <laughs> I would last two hours up there. I, I'd actually be crying before they even dropped me off of the plane. I'd be crying the, the whole plane ride up there or whatever. I would not... I would not be good at this, pumping your own water out of a river and all this kind of stuff. Oh, man. Hey, listen, uh, Sue, I, I wish you luck with this show. New episodes of Life Below Zero returns. This is this is going on. This is not the first season. This is like season two or three, I think. Um, uh, it's on the National Geographic channel, 9 p.m. And her website, if you want to check this out, maybe you want to go up on uh, some hunting trip up in Alaska or whatever you want to do. Um, it's Kavik River Camp, K-A-V-I-K, rivercamp.com. And uh, Sue, I appreciate you coming on the, uh, on the show. Uh, be careful out there. Stay out of trouble. Keep those bears away. And uh, maybe, we'll, maybe I'll run into you down in Miami someday, Sue. So. <laughs> hey, we'll, we'll call it a date. Thank you so much, Wilbur. <laughs> All right, you're welcome. Thank you. Sue Akins is... Uh, is there, that was pretty uh, incredible.